we're very appreciative of them taking time from their busy schedules and the busy weekends that they have planned here to join us for this panel. it's a great opportunity for the students and i hope it's an opportunity for all of you. let me start by introducing the panelists that's closest to me that would be on your left hand side patrick brennan who's founder and portfolio manager of brennan asset management based in napa, california born and raised in omaha, nebraska. ah next to him is bob rabbati bob is the founder, president, chief investment officer of rabbati and company advisors based in new york city susan schmidt sits in the middle there she's a senior portfolio manager senior research analyst at westwood holdings down in dallas, texas and ah next to susan is matt madigan matt is the founder and chief executive officer of blue world asset managers limited and finally on the far far right for you is mark weininger president of president of and a portfolio manager for the small cap strategy of tributary capital management here in omaha, nebraska please join me in welcoming these panelists we'll start with patrick and again these questions were crafted by the students in the portfolio practice of course the first question is in a period of high stock prices and consumer confidence what methods do you use to identify and select undervalued companies and i would add does that change because of the environment well i think the um yes yes without it i think uh sort of uh some of the premise behind the question is without question any markets or higher valuations are are higher it's it's harder to find securities but i think you you sort of stick to your uh discipline as to you know what you're good at uh recognize what you're not great at and uh you know act accordingly and and generally even in this market there's you know a fair bit that is uh you know you can still find pockets of opportunity i i tend to focus in on you know some areas where uh, there's there's maybe some uh historical and statistical reason to think that they might outperform you know i think i've talked in the past on spinoffs and sort of bank thrift conversions and sort of added another grab bag category of sort of anything in the liberty media complex sort of is almost its own little asset class and so usually within that there are um little pockets of inefficiency and so i, I would sort of say where, where i have sort of found it in you know in pockets lately is uh you know companies maybe that are based outside the united states and uh during a lot of this um you know sort of trump trade uh run up and um you know sort of the dollar is going to be stronger against every currency for years and years to come you know there's a, a fair number analysts hate fx i mean what's the intrinsic value of the euro you know i don't know it could be a lot different after sunday if there was a miracle in the election but it, i i think that where i have seen the opportunity is sort of where maybe fx concerns are weighing down on a, on a company and and maybe this continuation trade of you know the dollar is going to be strong forever i'm not saying it gets weaker i'm saying i have no clue but i i think over the next several years you know there is the possibility that some of these you know emerging market stories uh uh you know they can grow and you know specifically i think cable is a wonderful business it's loved here in the united states uh, for various reasons it's not as loved overseas it's an area of followed for 15 years i think i know it fairly well um and so in a market that's at an all-time high has anything really changed uh no i don't think so i think it's 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 still a good business it's still sort of sticking in with what i know well um it's just applying it across a, you know a broader spectrum and you know it could be two or three years from now you come back and you know everyone loves uh, you know sort of international cable stories they think the US ones are toast and you know maybe it'll be you know a different opportunity at that time but i think it's you know sticking with in your circle of competence what you know recognizing what you don't know and just continuously searching around that criteria and the way we will work the panel is if any of the other panelists have anything to add they can jump right in 
and if not, we will direct a question to the next panelist. Okay, I have an addition. Okay. Uh, what I learned when we were back in the on deck circle is that uh, I'm kind of the Sesame Street rule. Uh, one of these things is not like the others. I'm the only one here not a portfolio manager. Uh, I do general business and investment consulting. So while I'm an advocate of and student of the value investing methods, I kind of work over it and under it, and I rely on people like these around me uh, to give me the value portion of the analysis. And when it comes to identifying opportunities in a robust environment like the one we're in, uh, it, it is challenging. And, and it was fairly predictable, I think, that that would be one of the first questions uh, is, hey, where do I look? Uh, so one of the things that, that I look to, uh, did anybody here happen to read the BLS jobs report this morning? I, I had a feeling not. I'm a geek. I did. And after eight years of absolutely flatline performance, the last four months in a row, the mining and logging industries have started adding jobs. Now, for industries that have been down and out for that long, I like to go to see who's adding jobs in good economies and bad. So you can bet that when I call one of these folks on Monday, one of the things I'm gonna say is, can we find anything in an industry that's been down and out for several years? And that idea came from, suddenly, they're adding employees. Anyone else? Yeah, um, you know, I think it's interesting um, all of us manage modest amounts of money, and so that's a huge advantage, right? You're asking that question, so I would suggest that uh, having limited amount of capital that you need to invest means the number of opportunities you need to find is significantly smaller, so therefore it's a lot easier to do. So I'm fully invested today, and I really don't have any problem finding things that I think are compelling. So that's one of the things uh, that I would point out. And, and of course, that's particularly true given how capital is flowing into the markets. If it's flowing into the markets, right, there's this misperception today that passive investing is taking over. And I would like misclassify passive investing. Right? Everybody calls ETFs passive investing. I don't know how the hell you call something that turns over once a month a passive uh, <laughs> investment product. And it's clearly a speculating thing. And where is it speculating in? It's speculating in the largest companies with the highest valuations that have had the biggest success that the capital draws into. So if you're managing a large amount of money, I don't envy you at all. How do you find things to buy? I don't know how you do that. If you're managing a modest amount of money, I think there's plenty of, plenty of opportunities and pockets. As Pat was saying, you know, there's areas of interest, as you pointed out, mining and logging. We do a lot of commodity-related businesses. We think that there's a lot of interesting places in commodity-related businesses. So I'm actually, uh, and of course, since active investors have done so poorly in recent years, I'd actually say we're at a great point. I think there's a huge opportunity set that we have to differentiate that from here, you will look back and say, that's when you wanted to get into the business. Okay. <clears throat> Bob, I think that's a very good lead in for the next question, which is coming your way. <clears throat> what is your investment process when evaluating companies, and how much weight do you give to relative value? Uh, we don't do any, <clears throat> what we do is we look for companies that we think we can understand the business, understand the dynamics, therefore do some kind of valuation. And since a lot of it is commodity related or cyclical businesses, but that's what you think we can do. We're looking to buy businesses we think trade at a significant discount to what the inherent value of the business is. If it's a bad business or a cyclical business that's in a difficult period of time, there's an increased likelihood that you can buy a business at a very significant discount. So, you know, that's, that's a, a compelling part of the process. Any particular ratios that you use or? <clears throat> no, it, it really all is, uh, can we understand the business? Can we think out three or five years? Can we look at the business and think we can estimate what the normalized earnings power of that business is? What, does that, what would that imply as a value today? Where is it trading today? Is there that significant discount? And therefore, is that an opportunity to do that? And relative value? Relative values. It's relative to what we think the earnings power of the business is and then for what the future cash flows of the business are. And <laughs> it's really nice that. That's the relative value you are the long economic. So I'll, I'll add to that because there is a metric that I think is really important in my process and that's cash flow. So free cash flow for me and for my firm is what we look at. That's the number one metric that we look at. PEs are great, EBITDA. 
we understand that. We like to look at it. It's good to see where it is relative to peers in the market, relative to market value. And so relative is always good, but you need to understand what you own. And we like to own profitable businesses. That doesn't always show up in the EPS because you can manipulate the accounting. It's not always apparent what's going on. So you have to remember, it says gap accounting. That doesn't mean it's actually a cash number that comes back to the shareholder. And when we invest, we look at companies where, and I think everyone on this panel will agree, we're all looking for opportunities where we don't think the market really understands what's going on and the intrinsic value isn't represented in the shares. Now, we all probably have a little bit different level of comfort depending on what type of industry it is, what type of situation we're investing in. But we're all looking for the same thing. You find it by going and applying perhaps your specific skill set or where you feel more comfortable. Um, so for my company in Westwood, in my style historically, and you'll find as you guys go out and look for careers, you will develop your own style. You will be happiest working at a firm that reflects your style. Because I do believe that that's where you have a natural fit and that's where you will be the best investor you can be. So cash flow for us, very important. Relative, you can never afford to be ignorant of how it compares on a relative basis. But that shouldn't be what drives your decision to invest in a company. If I may add. Of course. Uh, you, you make one of my favorite points. And again, speaking from the macro point of view, uh, there's a reason that nobody's ever heard of SAAP. There are no specifically accepted accounting principles. They are generally accepted. <laughs> I like to say, that, and we do advocate a certain level of cynicism to, to go into this world. Uh, accounting is often thought of as science. Accounting is not science. Accounting is art in constant search of scientific support. <laughs> and the old adage, the entrepreneur who is interviewing accountants. Accountant one says one plus one is two. Accountant two says one plus one is three. Accountant three says, what do you need one plus one to be? <laughs> Keep that in mind. All of the ratios, all, and I, you guys, I. You guys have a sense of humor. I, I over 150 lines of hard data that you guys plug into these sheets and do your analysis. I, it's overwhelming, it's wonderful. But garbage in is garbage out. You have to look at the source documents. I, we're referring to EBITDA. EBITDA, one of the best uses or most common uses for EBITDA is this a proxy for cash flow? What if it isn't? Go look at the source documents. Or if the EBITDA, if the cash flow looks good, I would imagine this has happened to you too. I look at cash flow because, again, profit is opinion. Only cash is fact. You go look at the cash flow, and in, let's say, four out of your 10 years of historical cash flows, you see that 18 to 22 percent of it over four years was cash from financing activities. Well, now we've got some questions to ask. Okay, you, I, I, I would imagine you've seen and that. I, oh, any time. Yeah. And so I'll just add here: when you look at cash flow, remember I said free cash flow. So it, it depends on where the source comes from. Look at operating cash flow. What is that business actually making for you? And I couldn't agree more. Accounting is a, it's like a magician's trick with numbers. And so it's wonderful for uh, the big accounting firms, but when you want to actually invest in that company, you have to know what, what is the actual earnings power of that business. As a shareholder, what will come back to you are the cash earnings left over at the end of the day. And I, I always make this comparison. If management goes out and has CapEx, that's a huge number, and I find out that suddenly they're having board meetings in Hawaii because, and all the board members are flying down on their private jets that the company just bought. That's not a good sign for me as a shareholder. I don't like that. So look at how they're spending that cash. Look at the free cash, the cash that comes out of the business that's, that's not artificial. 
So if it's a, from a financial reworking of the balance sheet, that's artificial. That operating cash flow that comes back to the shareholder, that's what will determine your value. It, the, the one exception to the Jets to Hawaii not being a good thing is except when I'm invited. <laughs> yeah. I've been with that every time. <laughs> I want to skip down to Mark because we haven't heard from him and we want to get everybody involved. What are some major red flags that deter you from investing in a company? Well, I was hoping maybe, uh, am I on here? I was hoping maybe being down here I would uh, avoid any <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, red flags to invest in companies. Uh, you know, what What our process is based upon is a, is a couple of things. And one of the one of the key aspects of, of our process is, is it is a good business? Um, we believe that the, one of the key uh, determinants of something being a good business is, is its intrinsic value climbing, is it rising, is it becoming more valuable as time passes. Uh, one of the perils of being a value investor is the, uh, the value <coughs> trap that gets talked about a lot. So we, we define that as basically the, the stagnant or declining business that perpetually trades at a discount to fair value. Uh, I've, I've been party to many of these over the years. It's the old hockey stick pattern where you uh, you buy a stock and it's trading at a 40% discount to fair value. A year later, it's still trading at a 40% discount to fair value, but it's a 25% cheaper stock. Uh, and that uh, you're hoping that you get that one-time pop-up to fair value to make money in the stock. So what, what we have done in our approach is uh, to, to avoid that sort of thing is, is we certainly believe in value principles. We believe value outperforms growth over the long run. We believe it introduces a margin of safety which controls risk in your portfolio. Uh, but we overlay with that the idea of only good businesses because we think if you can buy an appreciating asset that's trading at a discount to its underlying value, that that should work into a stock that you can own in your portfolio for a long time. So what we try to do as a red flag is we try to avoid companies that we think are stagnant or declining uh, that may be deceptively cheap, uh, but but would be an extremely frustrating holding for us over the long run. I, uh, I really appreciate the value outperforms growth over the course of time. And I was just reading a headline this morning uh, with regard to Amazon. And the headline was, growth continues. Profit elusive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Patrick, we'll come back to you then. What is the value investment that you are most proud of and what came up in your analysis that led you to invest in that company? Um, well, I, I would sort of say I, I will uh, do the two that uh, you know would would probably be you know around the time of you know when Greg Maffei joined uh, Liberty Media, so back in 2006. Also, I'll tell the, the two parts of it is well, when El Capa and Linta, the two trackers that came out of that. Um, I think a lot of the background research on sort of why there was reason to believe value could be created with sort of a, a hodgepodge of assets and sort of following up on the, the figuring out who has been a strong allocator of capital historically. And I think putting that piece together and with the fact that there were sort of lean years, uh, you know, at the turn of the decade, you know, for liberty and sort of saying things could change. I think that putting those pieces together and being able to sort of say maybe a complexity discount of 35% is a little much. I, I think the analysis wasn't so much on the individual holdings of Time Warner Cable and News Corp. It was more around you know, who was the captain of the ship and why was it possible to believe that somebody with a fantastic track record might have reason uh, uh, you know, for things to, to turn around a bit. So I, I think it, it's uh, a lot of investments. I find it's not so much you, you know you read a you know sometimes it happens you read a write up you read something and you know you have a eureka moment. I think what's more common is 
you spend a lot of time around a particular industry or you know a particular subset of ideas, and then you know it, it's at some point maybe it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but it becomes cheaper. And if you're trying to continuously push yourself to you know get better, to to recognize patterns, to know areas that you think you, you know you might have some sort of edge, I think that's uh, you know sort of a process that. That, you know, maybe you can be there with, you know, with capital and courage when a, you know when a particular opportunity, um, you know, comes up. And so I think for, you know, there, there's going to be. I, I think for the lesson of that is, um, you know, sort of sticking with what you know really well, um, continuing to get better at that, and to be able to, you know, have the capital to act upon conviction uh, when the situation arises. I would say categorically, maybe just uh, to think about it this way, that the investments that we take the most, you pull uh, you're closer there. Uh, the investments that we've taken the most pride in or most satisfaction of are the uh, the relatively mundane businesses that uh, participate in oftentimes uh, sectors that people get very excited about, new technologies or, or high growth or, or uh, rapid development of, of uh, new concepts. Uh, and to look back and to say that you, you can find companies that are participants in that but are just kind of the, the, uh, it's the tortoise and the hare, the slow and steady wins the race kind of concept. Uh, we've got a couple, uh, one we still own in our portfolio, one that we got rid of uh, a year ago. We run a, a small cap portfolio. We try to buy stocks under $2 billion. Uh, we'll hold them in the portfolio until they get to $5 billion and then we let them graduate out. But, uh, in 1999, we uh, owned a stock in the pharmaceutical area called West Pharmaceuticals. Excuse me, West Pharmaceuticals. Uh, participated in the healthcare segment, but it was in the packaging and drug delivery. It made vials, it made pre-filled syringes. Uh, it was just a uh, thoroughly unexciting but very consistent and steady performer. Uh, we own that stock from 1999 at different levels. We'd add to it, we'd, we'd remove some from the holding, but back and forth. It was consistently in the portfolio until last December when we sold it based on valuation and market cap. And it far and away outperformed anything in the healthcare sector. And it was not developing a new innovative technology. I think people sometimes get so hung up on what's the new exciting thing that they miss uh, or, or they overlook the consistent participants in that. Uh, we've got a stock in our uh, technology holdings right now. Uh, it's a stock called Little Fuse. It makes circuit protection devices. As electronics become more sophisticated, you need to have more circuit protection. But it's again, it's a very simple business. It's one that isn't prone to obsolescence. We bought it in 2001 in our portfolio. We still own it today, and it has outperformed the technology space, even though it's not doing dot-com, it's not doing internet, it's, it's, it's not Amazon, uh, but it's done exceptionally well. And again, I think that's something that serves people well. Look for those consistent businesses that have a lot of visibility, that you can see where they're going to be down the road, and you can continue to own those for a long time. Well, I would agree with that. I, I think that people forget, so just echoing, um, and I know both those companies, and I've owned them in my portfolios over the years. People forget that, you know, in investing, it sounds very exciting. This is a very you know, glamorous job, being a portfolio manager, being an analyst. I, I truly believe I have the best job in the world. I love what I do. That I'm comfortable, I don't have to be at the forefront chasing after, you know, we're value investors, chasing after, you know, this sexy tech name and some new biotech firm that's coming out with this great new drug or drug delivery system that's going to make a big splash. I like boring. And slow and steady, those are the companies that make money. And people forget that. And, and as the rest of the world gets caught up, in this passion and excitement around perhaps a new product being developed, a new industry taking off. Think about the changes that have happened in technology over the last 10 years. That's all very exciting. But the valuations in that can swell and then deflate. And things that are boring have a way of just going along and making money all the way through. And to me, that's the most exciting thing because people miss out on that. They think they're boring, so they don't spend time on it. To me, that's opportunity. 
the best investment I've ever made, of course, is in uh, the firm I have and the environment we have. It's all about people. But I've uh, identified and worked with and nurtured people over time. And those are the greatest assets, because they continue to pick stocks that will be over time. So there's the kind of the office now, whoever's been with you since 1993. Um, <coughs> there's uh, eight other people in the office. We all think about picking stocks, picking stocks that are significantly undervalued. We love it. That's the environment. It's the passion we have. So that's, a, that's an asset that continues. It's a recurring revenue stream that kind of comes from those people. And the environment is such that uh, last year, Curtis Jensen, who was with Third Avenue Value for many years, joined us. And there's another person who's kind of coming to the team. So people, this is a people business. And if you have people in an environment where they can pick stocks and think about it, think about it in, independently on a three to five year basis, that's a phenomenal asset that pays and pays for. Behavioral finance will tell us that we suffer losses at twice the rate that we save our gains. The next question, and I'm going to direct it to you, Bob. You just talked about your greatest investment. What's one of the biggest mistakes you've made with value investing, and, and what did you learn from that? Well, I didn't think you were going to ask that. You asked about sustaining pain. That's the one thing I have. I think I have a much higher tolerance to sustaining pain than the excitement they do about making money. And so, and that inevitably, I think, has really led to my ability to make money is the ability to withstand pain. But that's not the question you asked. The question you asked. <laughs> you know, what's, your big, what's the biggest mistake you made? And what did you learn? So, so the, the biggest mistake I always made is so in uh, in. Uh, the early 90s, I invested in a bunch of insurance companies. I had a workers' comp company in California. I bought it a book. The insiders were buying stock. The insiders owned a third of the company. Uh, they were a differentiated product. They really understood their business. In fact, remember, was in 1991 was the first recession that ever hit California in 25 years. Claims went through the roof. They started to lose money. The company stopped buying back stock. Stock went to half a buck. I bought it at half a buck. Two years later, three years later, they bought the company. A WellPoint bought it, a healthcare provider integrated. They could provide services cheaper, two times bulk, so I'd make four times my money within three years' time. I'm smart. I buy another workers' company up in California, half of bulk. It then goes to a bulk. They, do, they buy out of uh, insolvency, the largest company in California. They leverage up to do it. Lots of smart people in it. I had grown to be 6% of my portfolio to be 12. I could, uh, the rights offering did the purchase. I could uh, up to 24. I went to only 20. I'm thinking this is the biggest position by far I ever had. A year and a half later, the stock goes to zero because the acquisition of the company had significant uh, incremental losses that did manifest us. Not the biggest loss I've ever had on one, one position that was, uh, went from zero to one. The biggest loss I've ever had is it's a Richmond based company and it's called New Market and it's controlled by the Gottwald family. The Gottwald family bought back stock in 45, 1998. When they had made an acquisition, when they bought that acquisition, there was nobody else to buy. They bought their own stock. A year later, it was at 35. From 35, to talk about suffering pain, I bought the stock all the way down to four. Uh, at four dollars, the company had a market cap of 50 million dollars, so it was spending 60 million dollars a year on R and D. Uh, they had paid down debt significantly. It was going to turn. Business started to turn. Got back to 15. I doubled up the stock 15. I became a 13 D filer in the company. It was going to do four dollars a share in cash flow. I say that to the CFO. CFO just lived through the, almost the bankruptcy of the business. He's like, we all lives to God's ears. I have no confidence anything's going to happen. Sure enough, they make $4 a share. So 15 months later, stock's 38. Hey, I'm pretty smart. Nine and a half times free cash flow. That sounds like a full valuation to me. I started selling stock. Then suddenly, they start, the company starts buying back stock, 48. Huh, that's interesting. Because there's insider ownership. They're buying it back not just for the fun of it. They're buying it back because it's an economic transaction. For them. Then they're buying it back at $60. So I'm selling stock the whole way. So, so like, what's going on? What do they know that I don't know? What am I missing here? And of course, that's what it was. I had spent all those years from 1997, starting first, to when buying it that entire time. So here it was to not appreciate the fact that there was this oligopoly business in there. That you know there's an oligopoly business because the largest player in that business is a company called Lubrizol that somebody in town here bought for a lot more money long after I had that first entry point into this company. I had sold the balance of my stock in 2013 when I got a $25 dividend. It earned $16 a share for $275 a share. So the loss that I sustained by selling that stock long before and not holding to appreciation, what I had acquired this business that had barriers to entries and all the things and free cash flow generations and all the things you want to not fully appreciate what I had owned, that's by far the biggest loss I ever paid my life. If I can just add on to the to the to the, the gist at the end of the point, I mean, it's most of the time when you're asked that question, it's always you know, there's really two types of money managers. One, some who's had horrible days, lost money, watch something go to zero, and another money manager who has not, but soon one day will see the, the stock go to zero and you know have a horrible day, and, and that pain is visceral. But it just mathematically, the sins of omission 
are the ones that are going to kill you a lot more. And, and one of the odd parts of the business, and in the past, I've used an example of all of the media industry. 2009, CBS was an investment grade company, had a 41% free cash flow yield, 41%. And so I reached for a thimble rather than a bucket. And you know, for a once in a generation opportunity, your returns from loading the truck up at that point, you're talking about a 10 year you know, tailwind to your, to your returns. It's incredible. But what's interesting is when you go out and you solicit clients and you tell them about CBS, and you know, they sort of give you the old pat on the back and sort of say, well, you know, that's a tough break, but you know, you'll do better. If you come in to a client meeting with the sin of commission, well, you know, we thought, you know, it was going to have a run. It turned out it goes to zero. You know, you can only have a couple of sins of, uh, you know, commission before you're fired. You know, ironically, you probably have multiple sins of omission, and you don't get fired. But that's the reason your returns aren't better. And and so, it, the behavioral finance point behind it is exactly, you know, what you expect. The losses are more painful than the gains. And when your mind thinks about investment mistakes, it naturally gravitates towards a situation when it's going to zero, when it's those other situations that are the true killer of returns. Not, um, not directly on point, but to the extent that we're talking about insurance companies, uh, which inevitably you'll consider at some point, uh, we said there's no such thing as specifically accepted accounting principles, but there is an evil in the world known as statutory accounting. And if you are looking at a retained risk entity, you need to know whether or not they are subject to statutory accounting. And if they are, you need to run your numbers, both GAAP, which is how they report publicly, but also the statutory accounting, which they are required to submit to the states, because the rules for solvency in retained risk are different than the rules for solvency under gap accounting. I'd, I'd also add to the discussion here. Mark, can you speak a little closer to the microphone? I know some people back there have said they're having trouble hearing. It's a soft, soft here. spoken uh, Omaha, and that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> a little louder, okay. We haven't, we haven't had any trouble hearing you, Bob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess I'd say, I guess start with, with one principle in this business is that you have to recognize you're, you're not going to have a winner every time and actually uh, the reality of it is, is is you're going to have things that don't work out in your portfolio. And you know, a, a baseball player, uh, you, you're going to strike out so many times even if you're the best home run hitter in the league. Um, so you've got to understand that some things aren't going to go, aren't going to work out in your favor, and uh, it, it's a business that can drive you nuts if you dwell on those. Uh, back to another sports analogy, they always say with with cornerbacks, the best ones are the ones that don't remember the last play because they're not focusing on the current play. So you have to look at it from the standpoint of. Uh, you hope you have more winners than losers. You're going to have some losers. Recognizing the ones that aren't working out early is a very important part of, of, uh, of success. I'd say things that have not worked out in our favor historically are, well, first of all, I'd put them in some categories. One would be uh, if we get outside our circle of competence, outside of, of uh, our discipline, when we've reached a little bit, we may find something that we didn't fully appreciate risk-wise or behave different from a price perspective than we thought. So to, to stick within the, the, uh, the discipline that you, you are comfortable with and that you are confident works over the long run. Uh, I would also say something that's happened to us is if, if something has permanently changed about a business and we're slow to recognize that. Um, here recently in the retail space, it's everything is just getting snowed under by, by Amazon. Uh, and I'd say that, that uh, and the other thing is, and it's probably ancillary to that, is that mall-based retailers are having a very difficult time. And I think in looking at things that were cheap and looking at things that were inexpensive on a, on a valuation basis, uh, maybe we were a little slow to realize the fact that maybe the landscape had changed, maybe, I don't know if it's permanently, but it's certainly for, for a uh, period of time here, uh, where uh, those sorts of retailers are having a difficult time and maybe even though they didn't look like they were expensive and maybe still seemed to represent value, exiting those earlier would have been uh, a good example or a good decision. And then the other thing I, I think that would be an error that we've maybe committed once or twice is that we've been, even though I, I talk about value over growth over the long run, we want to buy stocks that are undervalued. 
getting too picky on price. Uh, sometimes you have something you were waiting for just a little bit lower price to either initiate a position or buy some more of it. And then you look back after five years and the stock is up 45, 50% or what have you. And you say, you know what, I, I could have had so much more profit if I just wouldn't have been picky on that last nickel, that last 50 cents. So, uh, so that's, I think, a, a couple things that, that you can take away and, and use as, as lessons for your own portfolios. Okay, let's move on to the next one then. Uh, and Susan, I think this is yours. Uh, what is the most recent value stock investment that you made and what prompted your decision? <laughs> I've made a couple this week, so I have to carry this out. All right, so I'm going to talk in general here about a sector because I made. I think there's a sector that's particularly interesting right now, and that is where I am spending a lot of, if not most, of my time, and that is small and mid-sized banks. And so the decision around that, and we talked earlier about where do you find pockets of opportunity. So. Banks, I, I know banks, I've been a bank analyst, I'm familiar with them, I understand. It's a little bit of a different business model, it's quirky. I, I went on and on about cash flow and how important that is. Banks don't actually have cash flow. They can't, it's part of their business model. They don't have cash flow, they take cash and they give it away. Um, so, banks are really where, where interesting. Where do you bank? I know. <laughs> <laughs> they expect it back and then some, but you know. Um, so banks right now to me are super interesting because we're talking about you know big topics in the economy. One of the places you find opportunity is look for change. Where are things different? And so what are our big topics out there in the economy right now? We're talking about what happens with taxes, right? Maybe corporate tax reform. Yes, no, we don't know, but we're talking about it. Then we're, we're also talking about regulations and that we've got too much regulation, we're gonna take regulation down. And then the Fed is out talking about interest rate increases. We know they're coming. So we didn't see one this week, but we'll probably see one in June. What do all those three things have in common? Well, they're topical, and they're all tailwinds for the banking industry. So when I look at a small bank, it's domestically focused. I'm not talking about Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, once with international business. I'm talking about the guy who, who probably only handles the Midwest, right? The guy who's only serving the Carolinas. Those banks, all their business is domestic. So if any sort of tax break came through, that is great for them because they are the ones who benefit from it the most. Also, if a tax break comes through, who are the bank's customers? The local businessman. And who else is benefiting from that tax break? The local businessman. So he's feeling better about things, he's doing more, he wants to expand his business because suddenly now it's more profitable, he's gonna go take out a loan. <laughs> regulation, banks have been stymied by regulation. We went too far in over-regulating the banks, trying to prevent a 2008 crisis again. The pendulum swung too far in one direction. It's gotta moderate a little bit. If it moderates a little bit, that's a, a pressure that goes away for some of these banks because they're stymied by it. The regulators are breathing down their neck and they're not really sure what they can or can't do because the regulations have become so complex. Any clarity on that front helps them a lot. And then rates. <laughs> so most people who are out there, not on this panel, but your, your average person, when you average out ages, who's in the investment industry these days, they've been there about seven years. All right, that's about when the recession started. So for those of us who have been doing this longer than that, we've actually operated in different environments. There is a time when interest rates go up, and that is particularly beneficial to banks. So right now, I can say that I've looked at several small, mid-sized, regionally focused banks, and that is where I'm spending my time because I think that's the best opportunity and where I'm devoting my focus right now. That's a, I'd like to tack on the bank thing. That's an interesting observation. And, and to talk about the regulatory environment as well, because we've observed a lot of small cap banks, they get they get up to, because you, once you go over 10 billion in assets, you get a whole other level of regulation. So this is the idea that, oh, you're a big institution, you're gonna need more regulation, we gotta, we're gonna buckle down to make sure that you don't do anything dangerous. 
Well, then what small cap banks were doing was they were getting themselves up just under $10 million, 9.4 billion in assets, 9.5, and then they would stop growing because they didn't want to just barely tick over $10 billion because in doing so, you triggered a whole level of regulation and expense and complication. So what they would do is they'd wait around and they'd go and they'd do an acquisition so that when they, when they went over $10 billion, they would jump over that level. And so then there's been some studies saying, well, it has, has the regulation actually resulted in a whole other level of risk and that you have these small institutions that go and try to double in size or increase by 25% and then they create operational problems because they weren't prepared for it. So something like that, if you, rela if you relax some of that and you, um, and you work a little better with your organizations, that that creates opportunities uh, for the, the regulatory reform. That's it. I think it's very good. I'd just like to piggyback on that a little sure. bit. And the, the next question that came from the, the students I'm particularly interested in because Dr. Jerry Jensen and I wrote a book called Invest with the Fed. If anybody wants to buy it, it's up on the line. <laughs> but the question is, how does Federal Reserve policy affect value investing, especially given the current interest rate environment? And how much weight do you put on monetary policy? Do you monitor what the Fed does when you're making portfolio decisions? And I'll open it up to anybody. Yeah, how can you not? You need to know that's what. Premise, right, I mean, how you have to know, and, and that's you know the, the great thing about what we do is that it's very you get to learn everything, and so I I would say I just can't imagine operating and not knowing what the Fed is doing, what current rates are. How do you know how to do your DCF if you don't? How do you value future cash flows if you don't know what? You know what what the level of a risk-free rate is where interest rates and and just generally in this environment how do you not know i think it is great and i i am a bottom-up fundamental investor it is company specific all the time but you have to know what the bigger picture is you have to be aware of where in the world you're standing and if you're not then that's when i think you can get hit by a really ugly surprise yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that. We're bottom-up fundamentals-driven managers as well. But you can't just put the blinders on and say, I, I can disregard what's going on in a macro sense. You have to pay attention to that as well. Um, but I, I would say there's an interesting chart. I've seen several variations of it in, in the world of small cap. Russell 2000 growth versus the Russell 2000 value. It's the rolling 10-year returns of one index versus the other, uh, which has been outperforming, which has been underperforming. Uh, and it was late 2009, 2010, uh, value had been outperforming growth. It's something like two standard deviations uh, better than its historical average of where the two would perform versus each other. From 2010 until the middle of 20, I don't know, was, uh, maybe the end of 2015, we went totally the other perspective, that the small cap growth had been outperforming small cap value for a period where it went the other way, where growth was at a two standard deviation outperformance, completely the other perspective. And I think what's happened there, it's been because of exceptionally low interest rates, that companies that are cash burners, companies with lots of uh, leverage on the balance sheet, uh, there's, there's been no penalty for having all that debt, and actually it's been a huge advantage. And I think that's why if we hit this inflection point that we start to see rates go higher and the yield curve start steepening, I mean, one thing that'll benefit will be banks, and banks are 40% of the Russell 2000, or rather, uh, maybe 30% of the Russell 2000 value. Uh, but the other part of it is I think that those more aggressively financed companies are going to finally have to pay the price of all that leverage, and I think we're going to, we're starting to see that tick the other way where value's outperforming growth again. If, if I just, I'd add, just I think one of what a lot of value investors would take that question and just sort of say, you know, when you're doing your DCF, whatever valuation you want to do, you know, your center of gravity is interest rates. And if, you know, it's how many of us have lived through a period where you've had the worldwide central bank money printing? You know, it's, this is sort of unchartered territory and it just causes a lot of distortions and um, I, I think one of the ones is just so part of 
the, the textbook example is to sort of say, yeah, you avoid companies with lots of leverage. But if you can go out and issue debt, if you know, if there are buyers who you know who are going to give you terms for you know ten years at you know whatever, a, a tiny spread over treasuries, and you think about like if you're a European company and there's significant portions of you know, government bonds that are trading with negative yields, it's not a completely irrational decision to sort of say, I'm going to add debt. And I, you know, you see this, I think, in two ways. That one of them was mentioned that you know, there's a rush of money to anything with the width of, of growth gets bid up. And then you also see it in sort of the acquisition standpoint. You know, if you can buy money cheaply, um, you know, a cable company could buy a refinery and it'll be accretive to earnings, you know, uh, it, you know if the debt's cheap enough. It, it, so you can get some big distortions. And I think what you get into in this time frame is there are certain, um, it, the way I look at it is I, I think there are certain management teams who have proven ability to, you know, manage, uh, you know, maybe with higher levels of leverage and maybe if it's, a, you know, sustainable, a uh, business that's performed well in the past that makes some sense. For others, you know, there's there's probably a lot of reaching going on. And, and so I think you have, you're investing through a world of distortions in, in many ways. And and that, that that's very challenging. The best you can sort of say is, you know, so what do you do? Is you could go 100% to cash, you know, uh, say I'm not gonna play at all here for, for many years, but you know, I don't know if that serves your client well if, you know, if the day of reckoning is 12 years from now. Um, so I think it's a balance. I think it's it's sort of recognizing valuations are probably more expensive just by uh, most metrics. It's likely rates are, are going to be higher. And be a little more selective on you know, who you want to trust with capital management right now. And I'm going to say exactly reverse. I'm going to say exactly reverse. I don't watch what the Fed does. Uh, I really have no interest in it. It's bad policy that doesn't do anything. It encourages bad behavior. It's, uh, you know, you got to get uh, to get the guy out of the hospital, take him off the medicine, you're going to keep him in the hospital. It hasn't done anything. What's the positive impact of keeping low rates? I don't see how that's really been economically productive for the economy. So I think if it, if it does something to get back to a real rate, what's the inflation rate? The inflation rate is definitely higher than what the Fed rates and what lending rates are. So therefore, <clears throat> that's not a real indicator of what the cost of money is. And, and I would suggest that that's part of the problem. I would think a lot of investing today was how difficult and the valuations you have and the multiples for companies where you can do it, uh, a cash flow and then therefore you do the discounting. If you're using interest rates today, that's a huge risk because is that a sustainable interest rate? I would suggest these are not sustainable interest rates. And so that's why great businesses with predictable earnings that you then discount down and pay a multiple for, potentially, I think that's a big risky part of the market. Well, to, to illustrate just how interrelated all of this stuff is, uh, you know, I, I hope everybody was paying attention to small and mid-sized banks. We're talking about a couple of things here that seem like they're disconnected by minutes of conversation. Small and mid-sized banks, uh, the effect Amazon is having on big box retailers. Well, there is a tremendous amount of anxiety out there right now for the big banks who are holding the long-term financing on all of these national footprint massive REITs that own all of these brick and mortar locations at the same time that revenues are falling and interest rates are ticking up. So you can't separate these things. You, you have to look at all of it. And uh, personally, it, the relationship between uh, the relationship between Fed policy and cash flow is pretty straight line. I think it's about time that we turn and allow all of you in the audience that would like to ask a question, or as many of you as we can get in in the next half hour or so, please come forward. There's Mike Simley. Or we can bring them up to you. Yeah, either way. Who has a question? Right here. Hi, Mike. Um, I'm curious. What do you see as the prospect for? the use of artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, when it comes to investment analysis. Have you considered it, or do you know anyone who's uh, entering that field? 
I know a lot of people who are, you know, in terms of, you know, quant we have, it's, it's a, the quantitative um, investing that we have now sort of on, on steroids, right? It's, it's, if we completely advance that and artificial intelligence took over investing, in a sense we have it um, with robo-advisors where you can go online and, and it will put out a formula for you and that's the plan that you should follow. And there's your asset allocation, it's all set for you. You certainly see it develop. I think there is a, um, obviously there's a, there's a place for it, there's a market for it, and it can develop. And we, we talk about ETFs, and <coughs> ETFs are passive investing, yeah, I would be somewhat passive investing. You're letting something else, a person isn't really making the decision. So that's great as long as the market's going up. And I think when you're a value investor and we forget human nature, you want things to go up. That's great that they do when they go in that direction and we all feel good about it and low fees and having artificial intelligence, having robo-advisors, buying an ETF, all of that is very good. You don't feel the pain of that until things go down. Because then it's where you needed the, the nuance or the active management that protects you. When value investing, the point of having active management is that hopefully we participate in the up, we don't participate as much in the down. And so I think that as we move forward, I'm, I am hopeful that active management I think still has a very important role to play and in the years post-recession, as we're coming out of this, we've forgotten how painful that really was. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing passive takeover, we're seeing robo-advisors develop. I, will, I tell my young analysts when they come in, at the end of the day, everybody has the numbers. So everybody can get every single financial, everything that you guys can see, I can see, right? And vice versa. So there's nothing out there that's secretive or that's hard to find. You can collect all the data and read it. I will go back to Bob's comment earlier that this business is about people. So not only on our side, but the people who are running these companies that we're investing in. Because you're betting on these management teams to execute a strategy and, and run a business well to your benefit. Everyone can get the data. It goes a step farther than that. And artificial intelligence, passive ETFs, they're never going to give you that. So uh, how do you guys remain disciplined in applying your investment philosophy when your emotions tell you to do otherwise? And do you have any examples of a time where your emotions have sort of gotten the better of you and uh, made you make the wrong decision, or vice versa? You're talking about investing, right? <laughs> uh, well, that is. I, it, it's the hardest challenge. Any psychologist who's ever even spoken to somebody who invests will will tell you, you know, and that's that's where you fall back. You, I, I would argue you make a lot more emotional missteps and and have a lot more emotional knee-jerk reactions to what's going on in your portfolio or with any given stock that you really believed in uh, earlier in your career than later. Uh, because as time goes, it, dis the discipline you're referring to uh, for me is a function of time and experience and that's why uh, I appreciate the comments about uh, I think I do well because I have a high pain tolerance. And, and I, I really do think that over time, you become less and less sensitive to those emotional and psychological whipsaws that can happen to you early on. If, I, I would just add, I, I think I mentioned this in the past, but as the most practical exercise for that, I, I do encourage, and uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Greenwald who made the comment about you know, writing down before you buy something, why, you know, before you sell something, what your rationale is for why you're doing this, why you, you, you think you might be wrong, or you know, if, if you know, in a, a sort of a pre-mortem letter on why this investment's not gonna work out. 
And then when you revisit when something is down or you know something is zigging instead of zagging, I think what it does is it, it's just your mind has a funny way of sort of changing with facts. So you start remembering things. All right, revisionist history. Yeah, then then it really happened. And I think as a practical matter, at least you've got your own you know state of mind at that time staring you back in the face. And that doesn't guarantee that you're not going to still do something stupid under a moment of stress, but at least. I think it provides a, a mechanism to sort of reflect on something you've done. And, and so that simple thing, why well, don't, you know, it depends, I, don't, I run very concentrated portfolios, it's a lot easier for me to do that. Somebody's buying 100, 150 stocks, you know, that it's not going to be done. But it's, it's funny that I think it's just like one of those simple little uh, investment tasks, doesn't take that much time, but I, I really think that can be beneficial to where you're asking from that perspective. I would suggest that you're potentially asking kind of the wrong question because because you're framing it in did you do something did you make a mistake right so the first thing is I'm going to tell you if you're going to invest if you don't think you're going to make mistakes then I don't know what the heck you think you're, you are going to make mistakes so therefore to not make decisions that you think are based on the facts and information you have in front of you the judgment you have you make that decision you know that some of those will be wrong and you still want to make those decisions and you want to pursue that so you can't be 100% accurate you, you are going to make mistakes. You can write down that information, you can go back to it. The fact of the matter is every situation is different and you can look for this indicator and that indicator and last time that worked, that doesn't mean this time that'll work. So it's the situation, the facts at the moment that you have to make that decision on and you have to make the decision knowing you're going to make some mistakes. Appreciate as, it, thank you very much. As a securities investor, if you ever need to be talked off the ledge <laughs> and feel better about yourself, speak to a commodities trader. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You'll never be depressed again. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, especially, Susan, I enjoyed hearing your thoughts on the small and the regional banks. I wanted to ask you about a larger bank. I wanted to ask you about Wells Fargo. And in light of the recent controversy, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the company and if you would consider it untouchable or an opportunity. And just in general, when looking at investments, are there certain red flags that you look out for to try to avoid this? Or given how well the bank has done over the past few decades, is this even the type of thing uh, that you would want to watch out for? Well, controversy is always opportunity. So, and we're all, right, Wells Fargo, it's been in the news, they, they had a scandal that was revealed within the bank where there had been sales incentives. And so there had been, you know, basically manipulation of the customers. Customers had gotten accounts opened on their behalf, had different products pushed on them. Also that the employees at Wells Fargo could hit their sales targets and get bonuses based on this. And as it turns out, the more we've heard about this, we've learned that management knew about it for some time and that flags you know, had been raised and, and it had been brought to different levels of management to the attention of that management team and they'd ignored it. And so it has compounded into a much bigger problem for them. And now it's a perception problem. That is, it, it's, Wells Fargo is a very interesting example because if you went back a year ago, and I, was, I would be at a conference of bank analysts, nine out of 10 of those bank analysts would say that those Wells Fargo guys really know how to run a bank. They are great bankers. If you want a best in class, just top quality, they stay out of trouble, it's not like you know, B of A, Merrill Lynch, or Citi, or JP Morgan, those Wells guys, Wells Fargo knows where it's at. Right, they're the guys you can trust. Fast forward 12 months and you see this and then you're like, oh my gosh, what happened? So issues like this provide opportunity. What's your time frame? And is this something that's going to go away quickly? Probably not, right? This has a lag effect because people don't forget this. So you have to think about what your time frame is on investing, how much tolerance do you have for that, is the bank fundamentally broken because of this? Do the employees not function because of this? Those are all the decisions that you have to make. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that that great infrastructure that's out there, because they are very, very large, all that infrastructure that's in place 
I think there is a value to that. And I don't think it's fundamentally broken. I think as an investor now, when you approach it and you look at that, I think you have to determine how long does it take to fix it and get it back on track. And, and probably the single most favorable thing that's happened for Wells Fargo is that the airlines have started beating oh, people yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> Washington. He had to explain what had happened, and now he's breathing a sigh of relief. He had to retire. He's breathing a sigh of relief because now, oh, thank goodness, the airline guys are going. I'm off the hook now. So, <laughs> sir, please go ahead. All right, I have um, three questions, so bear with me. We talk about value investing, and generally speaking, either on a portfolio management level or on the uh, security valuation level, you have two approaches. One is top down, the other is bottom up. So my first question is, in your analysis, what do you typically use more frequently? Uh, my second question regarding to that is, well, we talked about artificial intelligence and all those industrial 4.0 technology events that we are seeing at our front door. How, in your investment uh, strategy, do you incorporate the changing of these really unknown technology impacting your uh, investments. And especially, I guess that would be going back to if you are top down, how do you evaluate that? Let's, let's that stop there. We've got three questions. I can't remember the first one if I get three. I think I, think I can remember, but top down or bottom up? Well, I, I think um, when you talk to those value folks, it's probably going to be a bottom up. I, I guess I'll, I'll share one step. But, uh, you know, maybe gives my feeling is that there was two IMF, uh, uh, it's two World Bank economists did a study of various economists and asked and tracked their public predictions on recessions in the September before the recession happened. So uh, they were looking in September of 2007 at, uh, you know, the economist's views about recessions for 2008. And they had done an earlier study from 1990 through uh, 2012. And from 1990 to 2008, they successfully predicted two of 60. Um, and in 2008, they did a little bit worse. They went, oh, they went, they, none of them, of the leading blue chip economists, none of them were predicting recessions. So what's interesting is you carry it forward um, they were predicting more recessions than actually occurred uh, in 2009, 10, 11, and 12, and, and then it goes down a bit. So I, I just, you know, these are very smart people. I'm sure they have very wonderful, complicated uh, models, and they can speak more articulately than I can about all of the various inputs that go in. But I think a little bit of that, you know, Charlie Munger predicting complex systems is, is quite the challenge. And so every time I think about making a macro prediction, I think back to that study a bit. And just, you know, if, if they couldn't get it right in September, so what are my odds sitting here a couple months early, you know, to predict the weather in 2018? Well, and um, uh, back to the AI concept, and I, I'll offer this as much answer as, as question uh, to you guys, but I. Uh, where I see AI I, having an impact, I, I, I think the impact of AI on fundamental analysis is fairly minimal because it's still only going to be based on the input and the quality of that input that comes from our CFOs and controllers and so forth. Uh, where I see and have seen AI you know, making the big strides and having the big impact is on technical analysis, which it doesn't sound like any of us here subscribe to all, all that religiously, uh, back to our commodities friends. And uh, the other is in trading itself, the impact on the speed with which markets move uh, within the bid-ask spread, wiping out open outcry in favor of the, I mean, what are we calling them these days, the black box trading that uh, that's where I see AI having the biggest impact 
is the uh, technical analysis and the actual speed of trading. I, it's funny, I live in Philly, so when they say AI, I think of Alan Iverson, but you, uh, <laughs> next question. Sure, thanks. Hey guys, um, so y'all probably are familiar with quant funds used to alternative data. Uh, for example, looking at satellite image data to predict earnings for Walmart based on the number of cars that are in the parking lot. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on the use of alternative data for value investing. I, um, I know back uh, when I took CFA exam, I'm sure it's part of the curriculum too, it's the mosaic theory, the ability to, to uh, piecemeal things together with lots of disparate information. And I think that's one of the keys is, is to be able to uh, use whatever information you have available. Uh, as technology becomes uh, more readily available and there's information, if you can draw an investment conclusion on that, absolutely incorporate it into your analysis. Um, I think that it's interesting how you're talking big picture, looking at a number of cars in the parking lot to predict sales and things like that. I even use examples, things as small as I was visiting a company one time, talking to the CFO, and one thing I observed in his office was the, the, the carpet was absolutely filthy. And I couldn't figure out why the carpet was such a mess in this, in this nice office. And then when we got all done with the visit and going through our normal, all the questions I had, he said, well, do you want to go out, because this was a machine tool company, so do you want to go out on the factory floor and look around? He said, well, absolutely. And so we got up and we took two steps out the door of his office and there was another door, which I didn't realize where it went. It opened right up out into the shop. And so this greasy streak on his floor was because the CFO was going out onto the factory floor a lot. And I look at that and I say, that's, that's a really good thing. That's an engaged management. And so, you know, any little information you can take from that, I say absolutely, you incorporate that into your investment decisions. I mean, was crazy footprints on the spreadsheet? <laughs> <laughs> it's a subcategory. It's a subcategory. Really cool. sub sub <laughs> I just suggest, I don't know if that's related to investing or speculation, because I don't know what this is going to tell you about the earnings of the company three to five years from now. There's a lot of data to get that information. I don't know what, what value, that's not what we, what I do, and I would not think that's most, what most value. There's value to that, but in a different format. Question. You know, in a world where we've seen uh, long-term investing, I've heard managers uh, say I held an investment for nine months, and that was a long-term investment. Uh, for for bottom-up uh, fundamentalist, um, what do you typically consider long-term holding, or what are your typical holding periods, and how do you determine your exit strategy? And it's easy to, to, to put a lot of time researching and figuring out what you're going to buy. But what, what goes into determining when you sell and, and what to sell? So our, oh, go ahead, uh, that's a great question because I think frequently um, you know, people talk about buying, the art of buying stocks and picking good names. It's the art of selling stocks that, you know, selling to me is much harder, finding out when is that right moment to move on. And it is, it, that is difficult in long term. I will tell you that in the course of my career, the definition of long term, certainly from my clients, has changed considerably. And so long term used to mean five, 10 year plus horizon. If you were a long term investor, you know, three to five years out, this is what I think things are gonna be. And you started to see it come in. Well, two years from now, this is where we think the company will be. I have, client, I have Teamsters as clients. They're not patient people. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, these guys say, yeah, we want to invest for the long term. They're worried about a quarter. When you're a value investor, quarter to quarter doesn't work. And that's not how we think about investing in a company. I want to invest in a business, and I really do want to be there long term, which for me is multiple years. So I think that, you know, long term investing, because the technology has improved so much, because our world has gotten so much faster, the information, the data flow, there's so much more access and the speed at which it circulates is you know, exponentially higher than it used to be. The tendency for investors to uh, take the pain, so going back to Bob's point of uh, high pain tolerance, and wait it out and ride it out and suffer through a bad quarter because you know that the next year, two years, is going to be great. 
that has become you know very hard you have to educate your clients along the way so that they're willing to sit through that with you and understand why they're doing that and keep in mind oh i'm sorry i was gonna say so there's part two of selling selling is I, I will go back to Patrick's point here. When you write up that investment thesis, everything I buy has an investment thesis and a write-up attached to it. And when I write it up, there is a price target that goes with it. And that price target evolves as the earnings come out and the company evolves. But when there's no longer a giant difference between what I think the price target and what it's valued at and what the market is telling me it's valued at, when that compresses, that's when it's time to sell. You know, the, I'd sort of say you have another little quirk sort of with the business. It, it, you have to know who your clients are as well. I mean, if you're managing money for, you know, a, um, an endowment that does not have any tax circumstances, you know, they want your money in the you know, best IRR ideas that, that you have. And, um, you know, turnover, uh, tax consequences are not a concern for them. If you're managing a high net worth individual, uh, in the People's Republic of California, you know, who's paying taxes on a couple different layers, then, uh, you know, taxes are, you know, a real life example. And I, I like to use specific examples and to, to, you know, I would say I had bit the bullet and, uh, you know, in the past, I, I, you know, I've mentioned, I, I did completely blow out of Microsoft. I, I am not an expert at this level to see if they have any competitive advantage, you know, from here. I'm much better at sort of saying, you know, hey, it trades at eight times free cash flow. If Windows goes to zero, they still earn two dollars a share in free cash flow. That I can make. I, I have no idea right here. For something closer to Markel, which is not as cheap as it was, uh, you know, when I've mentioned it in the past, I think there is a risk of if you try to sell this, it's it's unclear with what they're doing with uh, Markel Ventures if this is going to be a home run or not. But if it is, the potential cost of selling out uh, what the returns could look like 10 years from now could be substantial. And, and so for taxable accounts, I, I, I feel like that's you know, a, a big risk because really your IRR hurdle on an after-tax basis for that incremental idea is, is very, very substantial. So I think part of you know, when you're evaluating a money manager and you know, when a money manager is evaluating a client is it's that is a major consideration. Is sort of is this uh, you know is this a a tax? Is this is long term money? Or, yeah, you know, or is it another situation where you know, hey we're gonna you know we, taxes don't matter? Or if you're gonna turn over your portfolio 100 percent a year as long as you produce a return? You know, hey that's good with us. So I, I think that's an aspect that, that that really matters with with that question. And I know I'm not a panelist, but I'm going to respond, too, to the point. I think that one of the greatest dangers to investors, especially now in this do-it-yourself investor age, is a short-term focus. I read an, I was on the plane last night from L.A., and I read an article on Seeking Alpha, the, 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 the website Seeking Alpha, and it, it made me write, I'm a Huffington Post columnist, so it made me write a column that appeared today. And it was a story about that Berkshire's 2016 marketable securities portfolio, at best, was consistent with the market. It didn't outperform the market. And the individual said that Buffett should consider indexing a portion of his marketable securities portfolio because he didn't beat the market in 2016. Asking Warren Buffett to index is like pinch hitting for Babe Ruth. <laughs> you know, you, you simply don't do that. But I, I think it, it's that it's that short-term nature, and it goes to I saw a debate on CNBC, and the only time I turn on CNBC is when I'm sick and I'm home. So I have CNBC on, and it is brain rot. There were two individuals <laughs> arguing about a particular security. The moderator came in and said. We'll have to have you back here in six months to see who's right. <laughs> Bob, uh, uh, I spoke before about the greatest asset with people I work with. The, the other asset, you need. if you're going to be a successful long-term investor and have a long-term approach, you need to invest capital that's long-term that's consistent. Yeah. If you don't have that, you can't be a successful long-term investor. So that's a, that's a key component. To, that's what you want to do. If you're going to work for a place that's looked at, you know, short-term performance, that is going to be extremely hard to be successful, I would suggest. 
Yeah, and I'm, I, I'm not sure which perspective you were asking the question from, uh, but there's a, a difference in the way the concept of long-term investor is used between investing institutionally, like for the Teamsters, versus the guy walking in off the street to an Edward Jones office. Uh, so I, again, I'm not sure where you are coming from, but uh, long-term investor has you know some entirely different conceptual meanings depending on whose money you're managing. Now, I, I would say that CNBC is critical to our process because very important to me to know that this is the best day since Tuesday or the worst day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you just can't operate without that information. <laughs> But I, I would say that there was, and it's been a while since I've seen it, there was a, a really good study by Davis Advisors uh, a few years ago I saw that was showing the average performance of the equity markets over the long run. And then the average performance of the average investor over that same time span, and they pull ICI data, I think, and have to make a lot of assumptions to come up with this, but the average investor's performance was something like a third of what you get out of the market over the long run. And I think that it comes from that not having the long-term perspective. I think what investors do is they get in and out of the market. Uh, that's part of it. And then whether they're using individual stocks or hiring managers or using funds, I think there's a, a propensity to constantly change horses. Uh, my fund has dropped to a two-star fund, so I better replace it. And what investor is selling a two-star fund that goes and buys another two-star fund? No, I'm going to buy a five-star fund you get a lot of reversion to the mean in this business over the long run. And investors are constantly selling out of managers that might be good managers that are just temporarily outperforming and they, and they take all the pain, but they don't get the benefit on the other side. So I think part of that is just, that's exactly right. Whether it's investing or, or sports, how many sports teams are changing coaches constantly and how, how short the horizon has come. It's all human nature in the way that the information flow is going now. But uh, I think the reality of it is it's, it's hard to have a long-term approach, but if you, if you maintain that long-term approach and believe in your discipline and consistently apply it, that's your best chance for success over the long run. I'd like to give this gentleman right here who's been very patient Thank you. his chance to ask his third question. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question goes back to, uh, we talked about investing as investing in people, uh, management. And in the past two decades, we've seen a lot of scandals and the quality of reporting and earnings become more and more important. I guess my question is, when you are evaluating uh, the companies, what are the strategies and methods you use to evaluate the corporate governance? Thank you. Everybody hear that? It's a question about corporate governance of the company. <coughs> We're all in favor of corporate governance. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. No, I, I think that's, uh, that's something that's important in this business, and I think that I think a lot of people take that proxy process for granted. It might seem like you don't have the opportunity to influence the outcome, but uh, I. I think that it's it's something that we do in terms of uh, looking at different policies and and uh, you know the things as simple as uh, do the board members own the stock of the company that they're overseeing? Uh, if they're going to be stewards and spokespersons for the shareholders, I, I hope they're shareholders themselves. And looking at those sorts of things and looking at who's setting the compensation for the executives of the team. I mean, if you've got the executive management of the team setting their own pay scale and not having an outsider having some sort of influence or ability to, to discuss that or, or, uh, or make a decision on it, uh, I think that you end up with situations that aren't in the best interest of shareholders. Uh, but again, back to similar to, to our, our analysis process of company by company basis, it's the same thing with management. Is we want to look at management teams, we want to look at their tenure, we want to look at their experience, we want to look at all these. Uh, it's, it's hard to have a, a, a hard and fast rule that you can apply to every situation, but an uh, important part of our research process is a report. In our report is a list of the management team and talking about them and, and the board and so forth. And, uh, and do we feel they're going to do a good job for us as shareholders of the company? So let me ask, answer that question. So I would suggest to you, that of course, corporate governance is a dysfunctional system, right? So the way you pick directors is the same way we pick uh, the, the same way the government of North Korea picks the next leader. You have a choice; you can vote for the person or not. That's effective. Now, there's uh, uh, plurality rules today that kind of mitigate some of that. That's the selection process. When you sit on a board, there's multiple people who all are 
theory, equal. And so having sat on boards, having known the dysfunction that, that kind of exists in boards, if you're not going to invest in a company unless there's really good corporate governance, you're not going to invest in a lot of companies. And I, you know, it's part of the mosaic. You've got to think about the business. You've got to think about the manager. I would suggest to you that we're sitting in a town. We're all going to go to a, a shareholder meeting tomorrow. The corporate governance of Berkshire Hathaway is actually probably not optimal. There's a guy who sits, who's the CEO of the company, who's also the chairman of the company, and to have those two roles is kind of a strange function. <clears throat> and yet, you don't have to worry, because that guy is a phenomenal guy who's going to do everything to benefit the shareholders, and he's done that. But the board of directors isn't going to object and ask Buffett, what is he going to do? I'm sure there's decisions that he's made that in other corporations, you might go to the board meeting and say, hey, wait a second, what did you do? Where did you, you get the authorization to do that? So therefore, what's the optimum situation? Well, what are the facts? You know, so those, those determine it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a much more complicated question, uh, and I'd suggest just part of the mosaic that you have to figure out when you're going to invest in a company or not. I think that's a good place to stop. You've all, all got many other things to do. We thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, the audience. We thank the students.